Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, there is a feedback here. Um, my name is Navid Qureshi. I am a scientist in the diffraction group at the ILL, and it's my pleasure today to give you this presentation. Um, when I was first asked if I wanted to give this talk, I was a bit hesitant because of my health situation. I was very ill for uh, several years, um, and my immune system still has not fully recovered, and that's why I'm wearing the mask, by the way. But I had absolutely no doubt about what I wanted to speak. So spherical neutron polarimetry. For me, it's a matter of heart because I'm totally fascinated by this technique. And especially in the context that the inventor of SNP has recently passed away, made me want to seize this opportunity to tell a bit of his story and thereby in some sort uh, pay tribute to him. So I will use the first half of the talk to introduce you to the technique and um, talk about how cryopad works, which is the experimental realization of the technique. And then I will give you uh, a few examples of key contributions to magnetoelectric and multiphoric materials. And then I'll finish with the conclusions. Um, most of the magnetic structures are derived by unpolarized neutron diffraction, either on powder or single crystal samples. But both in both cases, you have the problem that you're only sensible to the modulus of the magnetic interaction vector by measuring the intensity of a magnetic Bragg peak, which is shown here in the single crystal case where we have the scattering vector Q for this particular Bragg reflection. And the magnetic interaction vector, or m perp, is the component of the magnetic structure vector, which is perpendicular to the scattering vector Q. And that contains the information we're interested in. That's the uh, orientation of the magnetic moments in the unit cell. But you see, this is a vectorial quantity. So by measuring the squared modulus, we obviously lose a lot of information, which we only can recover by measuring tens or hundreds of reflections. And sometimes that's not even enough. So the ray of hope came in 1963 when Bloom and Malayev independently published equations which relate the final neutron polarization with uh, generalized cross sections and showed that you can extract so much more information. And the dream, and here I cite Jane Brown, was to be able to measure all those terms in the equations precisely and independently. And if the dream has come true, then this is thanks to this man, Francis Tassé, a pioneer in neutron techniques, especially polarized neutron techniques, um, who sadly passed away earlier this year. He had an impressive career at the ILL and uh, contributed so much to neutron techniques. He uh, was involved in the development of Häusler alloys to polarize neutron beams. He invented the cryo flipper, which is, which is a neutron spin flip device independent of wavelength and stray fields. He invented, uh, developed uh, the cryopad with major contributions by Serge Pujol and Jane Brown. And I was told that at that time, he didn't have a lot of, con um, a lot of support by the ILL. And he was actually working with uh, Serge after his official working hours. And they recycled an old cryostat from the trash bin to develop first cryopad. So that's just to show you the amount of uh, enthusiasm and dedication to the idea and the project. And he pioneered the use of uh, helium-3 spin filter cells and constructed the optical pumping station here at the ILL, which has become the world reference. So the neutron community will forever be grateful to this man. And I say thank you, Francis. So those are the milestones in the history of SNP as defined by Francis himself. It's a slide which he gave to me uh, at the end of last year when I was organizing a series of online seminars and he was supposed to contribute, but he couldn't in the end because of uh, technical problems. So I'm happy to, to show you his slide. So everything begins with the blue malaya uh, equations, which show that certain components of the final polarization are related to different cross sections, nuclear, magnetic, interference, chiral cross sections. And six years later, Rist, Moon, and Köhler actually showed that by analyzing the longitudinal part of the initial polarization, you could, for example, separate nuclear from magnetic scattering. But they made explicitly clear that it's impossible to measure the transverse components. And that is something which stuck around people's head for a long time or too long time. In 1973, Alperin showed that it's actually possible to reconstruct the three-dimensional rotation of the neutron spin. And the key to success was to use two different guide field setups 
with different directions, separated by a zero field chamber. Um, a decisive point in Francis' career was his sabbatical in 76 at Oak Ridge, where he was working on superconducting niobium. That gave him a lot of ideas and technical know-how for the years to come. So already in 77, back at the ILL, he developed the cryoflipper, which makes use of um, superconducting screens. In 88, he presented the first cryopad, which takes advantage of Meister shields. And that's the first um, appearance of cryopad, which I found in the literature in 1988. In 93, Francis introduced the term spherical Newton polarimetry in order to clearly uh, distinguish from the longitudinal polarization analysis, which was shown by Rist, Moon, and Köhler. And although it took until 98 that SMP was finally recognized and accepted by the experts, he kept on believing in the idea and developed um, Cryopad to a second and a third version. So in order to build an apparatus like Cryopad, Francis had to master the art of manipulation of polarized neutron beams from the creation of polarization, the analysis, keeping the polarization, and manipulating it. So here I made a little animation which shows the different concepts which are necessary to build Cryopad. And I called it Francis Tassé's Polarization Lab, which because it's how I imagine he could have tested things. But it's a fictitious instrument, which, is, uh, which shows different sections separated by superconducting Meissner shields here. So we have our neutrons coming from the source, and they have all the same wavelengths to make things a little bit easier to see. As soon as they start to feel a magnetic guide field, they start to process with a well-defined precession, the Lama precession, um, which is dependent on the Newton wavelength and the magnetic field. Here we have a section with a polarizing crystal, which diffracts only spin-up neutrons. So here is where we polarize our beam. We only have spin-up neutrons now. In this section, we have a gradual change of the guide field, and it's slow enough for the neutron to adapt to it. This is what we call an adiabatic rotation. So we can guide the neutron spin like this. Here we have just a section where we guide the neutron spin pointing downwards. And in the next section, you will see that there is an abrupt change in the guide field direction. So the neutron spin does not have time to follow it, and it will start to precess around the new field direction. That's what we call a non-adiabatic rotation. But since we can calculate the frequency of the rotation, we can catch the spin after, for example, two and a half rotations. Here we have two samples. The first does purely nuclear scattering, which does not affect the neutron spin. Here we have a purely magnetic uh, refraction, uh, uh, reflection with MPERP symbolized by this uh, arrow. And this gives a 180 degree rotation of the neutron spin. It's not a spin flip, it's a 180 degree rotation. And here we have, I'll just pause it. Here we have the detector and an analyzing crystal, which only lets through the spin up neutrons. So for the moment, we cannot tell the difference between zero neutrons in the detector or only spin down neutrons. So what we have to do is we flip the guide field. And like this, we measure both um, states, and by taking the difference of the neutron count, spin up, spin down, divided by the sum, it will give us the polarization of our neutron beam. Okay, so those are the different concepts which are united in, in Cryopad. Here we have a sketch of the top view and a picture of how it's mounted on D3. And like in the Alperin experiment, you have two different guide fields on the incoming and outgoing side, which are called the nutators. You have the zero field chamber here where the sample is. But now the, the decisive thing is that you have a precession coil, which creates a magnetic field in the plane. And this is separated by an inner Meissner shield. So you have no field inside where the, where the sample is. And it's separated by an outer Meissner shield. So there is no superposition of the precession field here and the guide fields and the nutators. Now in Cryopad, you can align the initial polarization along any direction you want, and you can analyze any component you want, but it's uh, convenient to work in a certain local coordination system where you define X to be parallel to Q, because like this, you don't have any X components of MPERP because it's perpendicular to Q. We define Z to be vertical and Y completes the right-handed set. 
And uh, in this animation, I will show you how the neutron spin is aligned along X and how we analyze the Y component. So this is a, this is supposed to be cryopad with the cryostat inside. We have the nutators on the ingoing and outgoing side. This is the precession coil, our sample here. That's a helium three spin filter cell, which acts as an analyzer. So this is the guide field of the ingoing nutator, the precession field in the coil, and the same on the outgoing side. That's the local uh, reference frame. And now we set the angle for a particular Bragg reflection. And then we set the guide and precession field for this particular component, which we want to measure. So now the neutrons come in. They are polarized along the direction of travel. And now they will adiabatically rotate towards that field direction here in the nutator. Now they enter cryopad through the outer Meissner shield. So they will start to feel a new field direction abruptly, and it will start to precess around that direction like this. And here it enters the zero field chamber. So there's no magnetic field. There is no precession. And the neutron arrives at the sample with its polarization along X as we want it. So now something happens at the scattering process and we have a Y component, which is symbolized by this green stick here. And the same thing on the outgoing side, it precesses around the precession field. And when it comes through the outer Meissner shield, it will be caught by the guide field here in the nutator and will start to process around its Y component. And that's how we analyze the Y component by flipping in the end, this guide field to get the spin up and spin down parts. So absolutely magic. So if you if you rewrite the blue Malayev equations in tensor form, you obtain what we call the polarization matrix. That's the experimental or that's the observable quantity in the experiment. And what we have just seen in the animation is the measurement of this component. So you do nine different components or measurements and you get the polarization matrix on one Bragg reflection. Um, it's not really a matrix, it's rather pseudo matrix or tensor because the final neutron polarization is related to the initial one by a rotational part and a part which creates or annihilates polarization, um, which is independent on the initial polarization. So you can see that you can uh, selectively check or test different cross sections, nuclear, magnetic, interference, chiral cross sections. And it's nothing to be scared about. I mean, there's a lot of stuff uh, in this polarization matrix, but you don't have all the cross sections at, at the same time. For example, a purely nuclear scatter is the identity matrix. You can clearly distinguish a nuclear scatter or a nuclear um, scattering process from a purely magnetic uh, um, diffraction, uh, reflection, because this is a rotation matrix. You can clearly differentiate the direction of the magnetic moments by seeing, just looking at the colors here, which go from plus one to minus one. And you can even say or see if you have a chiral magnetic structure, like a helix or a cycloid. And you can even say the difference between a left-handed and a right-handed rotation of your spins. This is something you cannot do with uh, unpolarized neutrons. And this is um, but this ability to extract so much information from one reflection is what makes SNP such a powerful technique. And it's, it has contributed a lot to the understanding of magnetic materials in general, but especially to magnetoelectrics and multiferroics, as I will show in the following. So the magnetoelectric effect was already predicted at the end of the 19th century by uh, Pierre Curie. And it is a material property which enables the crosstalk between electric and uh, electric polarization and magnetization. So you can electrically polarize your sample with a magnetic field and vice versa. Multiferroics possess at least two spontaneous orders. And here I will limit myself to magnetoelectric multiferroics. So we're talking about magnetic order and electric polarization. Multiferroics are already used as magnetic field sensors and transducers, but their immense potential lies in the non-volatile data storage because it's much uh, faster and consumes less energy to pull your magnetization by an electric field than with a magnetic field. Um, so different ideas are, for example, in magnetic random access memory. So here you have a magnetic tunnel junction, and instead of polling your ferromagnet here by a magnetic field, 
you would put a layer of a magnetoelectric material and pole it by an electric field. And making use of the exchange bias effect, you would pull the uh, ferromagnet here. Or you make use of the two times two um, possibilities of magnetiz magnetization and polarization to create a four-bit logic with four different um, tunneling resistances. And that's inform uh, important for information density. And there are more sophisticated um, propositions like this mesologic device by Intel, which makes use of two of the recent key discoveries. That's the electric field switching of magnetism and the inverse rush by Edelstein effect. So on the, on the incoming side, uh, the charge, which uh, has either a plus X or a minus X sign, would create an electric field in your magnetoelectric material or multiferroic material, which in turn creates a magnetic field to pull your ferromagnet that's writing a bit. To read out the information, you use the inverse rush by Edelstein effect, which is the topological conversion from a spin current to a charge current. And the direction of the charge current you measure here depends on the magnetization of your ferromagnet. So very exciting propositions here. And such a device is uh, promised to have autojoule consumption, which is 10 to, the times, 10 to the four times less than the current state of the art, which is the spin transfer torque. But that's all theory because we are still looking for the perfect uh, multiferroic, which is room temperature multiferroic with robust magnetoelectric coupling and ideal um, technical properties. So now the, to the examples. Um, the first example is chromium oxide because it's the material which was first predicted to have a magnetoelectric effect, the first to be observed to have one, and it was the first sample which was used in cryopad. It has a central symmetric space group and has a magnetic transition at 307 K. So it's conveniently, um, you can conveniently investigate it at room temperature. And it uh, has a magnetic structure which breaks spatial and time inversion, which is a prerequisite for a magnetoelectric material. So SNP was used on chromium oxide in order to extract the sign of the magnetoelectric coefficient. In order to do that, you need to know the absolute configuration of your spins in the sample. The problem is the presence of 180 degree magnetic domains, which you have in different regions of your crystal. So here we have a, a structural unit where the spins are spin up, spin down along the threefold um, axis. And at the same time, you have regions in your crystal where you have spin down, spin up. Now, luckily, you can select one of those domains by annealing with either parallel or anti-parallel magnetic and electric fields but you cannot distinguish them with unpolarized neutrons because the difference is the sign in the magnetic structure effect. And since we measure the square, we cannot uh, uh, distinguish them, but you can with SNP. And um, what Jane, Bruce Forthheit and Francis did was to take a single crystal, align it with its B-axis vertical and measure this particular reflection. And they saw that by, um, um, by, Polarize or by, by aligning the initial neutron spin along Z, it would rotate towards the plus or minus X axis after the scattering, depending on the field treatment. So let's break that down for a second. Here we have the polarization matrix. With the particular setup they chose, you see that there is no Z component of the magnetic moment. So all the cross sections with a Z become zero. Then it happens to be that for that reflection, the nuclear um, intensity is similar to the magnetic. So you get rid of those differences here. And the last bit of information um, is related to the symmetry. It's a centrosymmetric structure and an anti-centrosymmetric anti magnetic structure, which um, gives you purely real and purely imaginary nuclear and magnetic structure factors. So the product is purely imaginary and you won't have those real interference terms. So you you get rid of those Rs here. And you're left with a relatively simple rotation matrix around the Y axis. And you see that the sign or the, the sense of the rotation depends on the sign of this cross section. And this is where um, this shows that you're really sensible to that information. And um, this is exactly what they saw. For the two field treatments, there are two different rotation mat polarization matrices, which is actually a rotation around Y either by plus or minus 90 degrees. And like this, they could extract the sign 
of the magnetoelectric coefficient. The next example is copper oxide, which is a high temperature multiferroic. It's so far the only known binary multiferroic compound, and it develops um, an electric polarization at 230K due to a spiral magnetic ordering. And the polarization vanishes at 230K where the magnetic structure becomes collinear. It has been shown by DFT and Monte Carlo simulations that applying pressure would drive the multiferroic state towards room temperature, which is very interesting. And it was also recently confirmed by Newton diffraction under pressure that this transition could actually be pushed towards room temperature with um, applying pressure. But before being interesting as a multiferroic, copper oxide was studied as a building block of high temperature cuprate superconductors. And it was um, expected or hoped that uh, the magnetism in copper oxide would give information about the whole pairing magnetism, uh, whole pairing mechanism in the superconductors. So there is an experimental team uh, consisting of more or less the same people, which did two studies, one using unpolarized neutrons and another using SNP. And they saw that there is a huge model ambiguity. So those two magnetic structures are profoundly different, but they give more or less or comparable agreement factors. And it's only by using SNP that they could tell the difference between the different uh, magnetic structures. By measuring the polarization matrix on one reflection, they saw that it's completely different for the two models. And they could say that this is the correct one. So that showed the superiority to unpolarized neutrons, especially if you have weak reflections, which is the case for copper, and in this case, also complex non-collinear structures. A big deal in multiferroics is, of course, their switching behavior, because you want to write and read information. And in copper oxide, you have a strong coupling between magnetic order and electric polarization, which gives you the possibility to control chiral domains with an electric field. So you can um, switch from a left-handed spiral to a right-handed spiral. And this is something you cannot access or measure with unpolarized neutrons because the magnetic chirality is inaccessible. This is also um, related to this vector um, property, which you cannot extract by measuring the squared amplitude. And this has been nicely shown in this work here, where we have two different electric field directions along the positive and the negative B direction. And you show that you see that those two matrix elements of the polarization matrix have a different sign. Those are these two elements, which we call the chiral terms. And that gives you the idea or the information about if you have a left-handed spiral or a right-handed spiral. So SNP can tell the difference between those two states. And the last example for copper oxide is um, the search of the so-called AF3 phase. I have told you about two phases in copper oxide. But the usual sequence of magnetic phases in, multi or in spiral multiferroics is that there is an, another magnetic phase between the paramagnetic and the multiferroic phase, which is a, a collinear spin density wave. And that was not found in copper oxide using neutrons. Although macroscopic methods suggest a small phase pocket here with a stability range of only 0.5 K. So it's very difficult to measure with neutrons because the magnetic moment is also already very, very small, close to the nail temperature. And we tried by measuring very long on the strongest magnetic Bragg peak, but we absolutely see no anomaly in the intensity. So the idea was to try that with SNP and have a look at those matrix elements which are supposed to have the biggest change. So at the time, my collaborator who came with the crystal had full confidence in the idea. He said, Navid, this is not going to work. Let's try another crystal. And I told him, well, let's at least measure overnight and let's see what happens. And this is what we measured overnight. We have this huge uh, change at the transition between the collinear and the multiferroic structure, but we also see a clear anomaly in the AF3 phase. And that was the first microscopic proof of that phase in almost four decades of neutron scattering on copper oxide. So by measuring and analyzing two polarization matrices, we found a, a model which explained the data. And this was done using Mactopol. This is a program I have developed to treat polarimetry data at the time. And that helped a lot to revive the polarimetry community. But um, with the time it has developed, it also does um, 
um, it, you can analyze unpolarized data uh, on single crystals and powder, also X-ray data and uh, constant wavelength and time of flight. So what we could extract is that we have a phase coexistence of two spin density waves with different moment directions. And that um, helped a lot to understand copper oxide uh, globally, and especially in terms of its uh, detailed balance of energy or exchange interactions. So last very short example, the lafocyte, which is a pressure-induced multiferroic. It has a complex pressure temperature phase diagram with at least four complex magnetic phases. And what Terada and co-workers saw by um, investigating it using unpolarized neutrons is that they could not deduce certain um, information and details of the different magnetic structures. So the idea was to try SNP under pressure. So in that case, I was the one who was skeptical. I didn't think that would be possible because the sample is very small and very small, I mean, very, very small. And um, it was placed in this non-magnetic pressure cell up, which goes up to 10 gigapascal. And to make the story short, it is possible. We could deduce five complex magnetic structures because we found another one here in only seven days on this tiny sample. This is something which you cannot do or you cannot achieve that using unpolarized neutrons. It's, um, you can extract so much more information with SNP. And that showed that it's an ex excellent approach to study novel pressure-induced phenomena associated with complex magnetic order. So that brings me to the conclusions. I hope I could show you that SNP is a powerful technique with sometimes no alternatives for certain scientific challenges. The sensitivity to magnetic domains makes it the ideal probe to study the switching behavior of smart materials. And it's still uh, possible to measure very weak signals as long as they're different from the background, which is important for weak magnetic moments, small samples, but especially thin films. So SNP, especially on the instrument D3, is important for future spintronic candidates. But it would also be interesting to see how it um, can be useful to study twistronics, which is an emerging field where you have 2D materials which are stacked on each other. And by twisting them, you can influence their properties, especially the magnetic structures. So that is some exciting work which can be done in the future. Small problem is that our instrument D3 has been reduced to 50% capacity. And we have a ridiculous overload of almost six in College 5B. So we are missing a lot of science. And if we go on like this, we will just kill our community. So my last conclusion is that we really need D3 at 100% in order not to miss out on that science. And with this, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>